All right, it is 5.30, so I say we go on and kick this off and uh, let's get this started. I would like to say hello to everyone who has joined us this evening um, and welcome to our Zoom and Learn uh, this evening uh, with Dr. Amelie Ollier. Make sure I got that right. Uh, we're excited to have her with us this evening. <clears throat> I want to first introduce myself. My name is, I'm Tucker Saffington and I'm the Assistant Director of the Alumni Association. Uh, I work with our special programs, our outreach, and our sponsorships that we, uh, we deal with on a yearly basis at the Alumni Association. And one of those great things we have is uh, what was normally a lunch and learn uh, due to COVID-19. We're now Zoom and learning with everybody. So we're excited about that. Uh, and we're excited to have you all with us. Uh, you're a very unique group. I believe everyone here has a connection to our nurse practitioners field, either in the professional setting or in the education setting. And we're pumped to have you with us. So. I don't want to talk much longer. I do just want to say a few quick things, though. I want to say a special thanks to our sponsor for our Zoom and Learns, which is the UL Federal Credit Union. We appreciate everything you do with the Alumni Association. I'm now going to kick it over to a good friend of mine who works in our development department, uh, Nicole Jones, who works with the College of Nursing and Allied Health, uh, working to help grab some money someday to help our, our program further itself. So, But more importantly, working with amazing alums who have contributed so much to our institution and specifically this department. So Nicole, you mind if I throw it over to you? Sure, no problem. Hello everyone and welcome. We're so glad you could join us this evening. Um, and I'd like to just say a special thanks to Dr. Olye for not only giving her time generously, but she is one of those amazing donors um, that Tucker mentioned um, that I have the privilege of working with. And uh, in case you haven't heard, she recently established a new graduate, a new endowed graduate scholarship in nursing. So um, in fact, I saw her name earlier. I think Anna. she popped off, but Anna, oh, there she is. Hey, Anna. Anna is the inaugural recipient of Dr. Ollier's scholarship. So we're thrilled that you could join us tonight, Anna. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and introduce and turn it over to uh, the amazing dean of this college, Dr. Melinda Obeleitner, and she'll introduce Dr. Oye. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Tucker. Before I introduce Dr. Oye, um, Marissa and Dr. Broussard and Dr. Lemoyne, would y'all like to say hello? We'll start with Marissa. If you want to just introduce yourself and say hello. Sure, thank you, Dean Oberleitner. My name is Marissa Collins and I'm the Director of Constituent Engagement on uh, campus. So I work across the whole university in varying ways to uh, engage, engage our constituents, everybody that's involved with the university. So thanks for joining us this evening. And thanks to Dr. Ollier for, for participating and, and I, I really look forward to this, so. Thank you, Marissa. And Dr. Lisa Broussard, who's a, our Associate Dean in the College of Nursing and Allied Health Professions, Dr. Broussard. Hi guys, welcome to all of you. Of course, special thanks to Dr. Oye. We always love uh, hearing from you and having you and your support of our college. But mm -hmm. thanks to the students for joining us tonight. Uh, it's so good to, uh, to be able to engage with all of you. We always enjoy any opportunity we have to be with our students. So thanks and uh, enjoy the, uh, the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Broussard. Dr. Lemoyne. Good evening, everyone. It is so wonderful to see you guys. You know, we just got finished advising and, and uh, as you guys progress through the program, uh, I'm just so amazed at, at your performance and, and you know, the, the wonderful nurse practitioners that I know that you're going to be. I'm also excited to see that we have two of our DNP students who are nurse practitioners here with us this evening. So thank, thank you, Dr. Olye. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Again, it's wonderful to see you guys. Thank you, Dr. Lemoyne. And um, happy Nurse Practitioner Week, by the way, to uh, our nurse practitioner faculty who are uh, in this meeting. And to Dr. Oye, of course, who's a nurse practitioner as well. And um, I know some of our DMP students are nurse practitioners, as Dr. Lemoyne said, and, and our, grad our nursing graduate students are seen to be nurse practitioners. So. Um, now, nurse practitioners are in, incredibly important to our country and to the citizens of our country. And, and it's great to have one of those uh, fabulous nurse practitioners here that uh, she's, a, she's a celebrity in the nurse practitioner world. And uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about her and uh, then I'll let turn it over to Dr. Ollier. 
Uh, Amelie Oye is a University of Southwestern Louisiana graduate. She obtained her Bachelor of Science in Microbiology in 1984 and a Bachelor of Science in Nursing in 1988. She holds a Master's in Cardiovascular Nursing from McNeese State University, an FNP Postmaster's degree from USL, and the DNP degree from the University of Tennessee at Memphis. After many years of direct patient care, she's devoted the past two decades of her career to equipping nurse practitioners with the knowledge and skills they need to pass national certification exams, maintain certification, and stay up to date with essential clinical skills. Until Dr. Oye started doing that, there wasn't anyone um, who was um, who was doing what Dr. Oye has has done, has what she started, and what she's taking to an amazing level. And I hope. She'll talk about her career progression uh, when she has an opportunity to talk. Uh, Dr. Oye is the CEO and president of Advanced Practice Education Associates. You probably know that as APEA. She funded that company in 1997. She is a nationally certified family nurse practitioner and a fellow of the American Association of Nurse Practitioners. She's an expert on nurse practitioner practice and has presented hundreds, probably a thousand, huh, Amelie, at this point, uh, so. uh, certification exam review courses and lectures on advanced pharmacology and primary care topics. She's known for her informative, engaging speaking style, and she's an invited speaker at numerous national and state conferences every year. She's an amazing person who's authored and co-authored 25 books for primary care providers. And again, one of the first, if not the first uh, to do that uh, for nurse practitioners. She's the creative mind behind dozens of APEA products that provide educational and practice support to new and experienced NPs. APEA was established by Dr. Oye in 1997 to meet the need for high quality certification preparation tools for new nurse practitioners. Today, APEA encompasses continuing education and clinical resources for experienced MPs. Co-founders Dr. Amelie Oye and Jeannie Doucet have focused their business on providing relatable, relevant education using the most effective learning techniques and on creating and producing innovative clinical tools and resources. APEA has equipped thousands of new nurse practitioners to pass the national certification exams and is committed to the success and professional development of nurse practitioners throughout the United States. It's, it's not an overstatement to say that Dr. Olye, by what you've heard of what she's accomplished, revolutionized um, and started a new industry really. Um, because again, there was no one doing what she, do, what she started and what she's doing today. So it's a real treat to have her with us tonight. I can't wait to hear uh, what she has to share with you. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Olye. And by the way, she, um, we worked together uh, a long time ago. Um, she's one of the best nurses I ever worked with. And I, I, don't, I don't say that often. Uh, I'm a tough critic when it comes to that, but I can honestly say it about Dr. Olye. So Amelie, thank you for being here and taking this time with us and our students. And we, we can't wait to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you very much. It's really, it's a treat for me to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm never comfortable talking about myself. So they, um, Nicole and, and others asked me to kind of share my story. So, so I'll do that. But I want to start by wishing everybody a happy Nurse Practitioner Week. And, you know, today is Veterans Day. And uh, I have a father who is a living World War II veteran. So I would be remiss if I didn't also uh, wish, wish all the veterans a uh, happy, happy Veterans Day today as well. Uh, I really want uh, to the students to feel comfortable in asking questions. I don't want this to be a monologue. I like it to be a dialogue. And so if you have questions that pop up or, you know, you want to ask me something, please don't hesitate to do it. I'd like to get to know you better because in a year or two years, I guess at the most, you're going to be my colleague. And so I would like to get to know you. I know one of you already, Anna Edgecombe. So I I've met her and I've had a, a conversation with her as a scholarship recipient, but, um, but anyway, I would like to get to, to know all of you. Um, so let me just kind of start out by saying this, and, and maybe uh, Dr. Oberleitner will, will cover her ears, but I never, ever wanted to be a nurse. I never wanted to be a nurse because my idea as a, as a high school graduate was that nurses were people who 
like empty bed pans. And I like, I did not want to do that. And so as you may have heard her say, my original degree was in microbiology and, and I love the sciences. I have a degree in chemistry. I, I love that. And you know, when I graduated, I had those two degrees and, and I had no idea what I was going to do. And so I found myself um, teaching. I took a job as a high school teacher and I taught chemistry and advanced biology and honors chemistry. And, you know, I thought it was, it was fun for the first year, but then I was really bored because I, I found myself teaching the same thing like three times a day. And that's hilarious now when I think about it because I present the same two day review course 50 times a year almost. So it, it's really kind of funny when you think about that, but I, I taught high school for a couple of years and, and I just didn't, I didn't want to do that. It wasn't a challenge. And I don't know if you know this, but UL was one of the first people in the state. And at the time it was USL and they had um, uh, an accelerated nursing option program. So if you had a degree in anything and you had the prerequisites, you could jump into this accelerated nursing option uh, and you could become a nurse in like 15 months. And I had been in school because I love to learn I'd been to school for a long time, so I had all, I had all the prereqs. So I, I jumped in, and there were only four of us in the program. And I decided that once I went through the summer, which had like health assessment and pharmacology and, and another nursing course, that I wasn't going to continue in this nursing program because I didn't want to be a nurse. I only took that course because I wanted to take pharmacology, and I really liked it. Well. You know, at the end of a summer, and, and you can appreciate this as an MP student and, and a nurse, you know, you go through thick and thin with your, your students, you, you know, you, they're like your family. You spend more time with them sometimes than your own, your husband, your wife, your children. So at the end of the summer, when I had taken this pharmacology class, the, the group of them, and, and I wasn't going to continue, um, the three girls I was in there with said, oh, no, you, you finish in this program with us. And they wouldn't let me quit. But I still didn't want to be a nurse. So, you know, I, I, obviously I finished the nursing program and I said, well, that's it. I'm not taking boards because I don't want to be a nurse. And they said, oh, no, you're taking boards. Well, I, I took boards and I, and I passed. And I loved being a nurse. I absolutely loved it. I went into work in ICU and I really wanted to be a CRNA. You know, I, I liked the, you know, I'm just sort of an adrenaline junkie and, and I like the, the hustle and bustle and the, the it really matters kind of environment in ICU, but I wanted to be a CRNA until I found out that you had to wake up early to get to the hospital early for all these cases. And I said, oh no, I do not like waking up early. So I didn't want to do that. And um, I was talking to my brother, my youngest brother, who was a senior in law school at the time. And, uh, and he said, I said, Jimmy, I'm looking for something else to do. And he said, you don't like being a nurse? And I said, yeah, but you know, I feel like I know what to do with every patient that comes through the door. And he said, you know what? You would be a great attorney. You should go to law school. And I said, really, what do you have to do, you know, to get into law school? And he said, you have to take this, this test called an LSAT. And I said, oh, I said, when do they give it? Maybe I'll do that. And he said, it would be a great combination to be an attorney and a nurse. So overnight, I found out that the LSAT was going to be given on Saturday. And I went and took it. And I got into three different law schools. And I, I thought, wow, th you know, this is great. So I, I went through the first year of law school and I realized that I really liked law school, but I didn't want to be a lawyer. It just, it just wasn't me. I didn't want to spend the rest of my days fighting. So at that time, there still wasn't a nurse practitioner role in, United, in uh, Louisiana. It, there was sporadic people in the United States. This is like 25 years ago. And so but I knew I wanted to go back into nursing because at that point I knew I really loved it. I loved being close to the patient and I loved having a relationship with the patient. And so um, I got out of law school 
and I started my master's. And I, I finished my master's through McNeese in cardiovascular nursing because I, you know, I was the adrenaline junkie. And so um, I practiced and I, and I worked at Lourdes and Lourdes was terrific for me because they really allowed me to, to work around my school schedule. So I got a master's, but I had a teacher at McNeese who said, there's this new role for advanced practice nurses and it's called a nurse practitioner. And I remember raising my hand that day and saying, what is that? And she began to talk about it because she was from Texas and the role was being developed in Texas ahead of Louisiana. And so, I, and she said, you know, you work in a clinic. And I remember her saying, instead of riding the bus, you drive the bus. And so I thought, and she explained a little bit more about it. And she said, you will only be limited as a nurse practitioner by how much you want to work. And so I thought, wow, I would really like to do that. So I completed that master's and then I jumped into, UL is always one of the first people to have a program. They, they started a family nurse practitioner program. And once again, I found myself in the first cohort of a brand new program. And so I, I did that, I guess it was maybe a year or two years. I, I don't even remember what it was. And people who are getting ready to prepare for boards will appreciate what I'm about to tell you. So there were four of us in my nurse practitioner cohort, and we knew we had to take this exam to practice, but there really weren't any products out there to help us pass this exam. Like there weren't any question books. There were no question books. Now you notice I didn't say online products because really the internet wasn't like a big deal. And so there were no question books there were no like outlines of content. Um, it was a struggle. So two other people out of the, you know, there were four of us in the cohort and um, two other girl females who were in the class said, look, we, we pass in this exam. And, and I said, I know I'm only taking it once. And she said, um, she said, what are we gonna do? I said, I got a good idea. You know what we ought to do? we ought to like divide up all the topic areas like respiratory, cardiac, anemias, you know, we ought to divide all that up and y'all can come in my, come to my office at, in the evening and everybody will be in charge of teaching a certain section and you got to come prepared because the other two of us are going to ask questions. And that's how we did it. We set up an, an outline and you took the, the area that you were comfortable with to make sure the other two people knew it. And we just went through diagnoses and we went through it. And the next week it was, it was you know, the next person's chance to do that. And so that's how we prepared. And we built outlines and I suppose we had not graduated yet. And it was probably six or eight weeks before graduation. And I remember saying, we have such good notes here. We should not waste this why don't we teach the, why don't we teach what we just went through? And so the, the other two people said, oh yeah, we'll, we'll do that. And one was already teaching. She taught part-time at LSUE in the nursing program. And that was Donna Levy. And the other person was Cindy Priest. And so, um, so we decided we would teach this because there would be other nurse practitioners, students coming out who would struggle as much as we did. So we, um, we took our exam and thankfully we all passed. Um, and, but you know, it was a paper exam. It wasn't on the computer, it was a paper exam. And so we had to wait to get a paper result eight weeks later. And you were allowed at that time to practice on a temporary license, which we did. And we all got jobs, even though very few people knew what a nurse practitioner did or was. They thought if you said I'm a nurse practitioner that you were a practical nurse, you know, like an LPN. So there was a lot of education that went along with trying to, you know, to, to get a job, but we all got jobs. And, uh, and so we decided, why don't we form a company? And, you know, since I was little, I've always liked the idea of a business, you know, 
Um, and so we, we formed a company and we quickly realized that we would not be able to, to, to earn any money or pay any bills if we didn't have a business person. So I had a good friend at the time who was in the MBA program at UL and she became the, the, you know, the BM, you know, we called her the BM, the business manager. And so she is my business partner today and that's Jeannie Doucette. And so, um, you know, so all of a sudden we had this company and it, we had a struggle trying to find a name for it. And so anyway, we've, we got a name and, and um, we realized that in addition to this course that we wanted to teach, people needed practice questions because that's what the exam was. It was questions, multiple choice questions. And if you didn't have anything to practice with, you're gonna struggle like we had. So we pretty much did a brain dump after the certification exam of all the questions and topics we could remember. And from that, we wrote the very first question book. And it was Donna and Cindy and myself. And, you know, it's a tremendous amount of work to write a book, especially if you've never written one before. So we, you know, we had to investigate that. It's a tremendous amount of work that had gone into that but we finally got the book printed. And you know that was something else, a trick to find a printer. And so we did, and we found ourselves advertising in the, the Blue Nurse Practitioner Journal, which you should know about. You don't have to get a subscription to it, but you ought to know about it. It's like the original journal for NPs. And an ad, a half page ad in there, now think about this, 25 years ago um, was $1,500. For those, we didn't have any money. We each put up about $500 to start this company. So $1,500 for an ad was, was a stretch. It took most of our money. And so we decided we were gonna take the plunge. So we bought this ad and you know, there weren't, you couldn't place an order online, but you could fax an order. Well, I came home from work one day and my fax machine was out of paper because we had advertised this question book and it had gone out to NPs across the United States or students and they all wanted a copy of this book. So we quickly made our $1,500 back enough to put another ad the next month. And so that really is kind of how it got going. And then we decided they needed to be a more formal like set of notes. And so we put together a, a review book, but about two years had passed now and Donna and Cindy decided that they wanted to do something else. They wanted to go in a different direction. So Jeannie and I bought them out and Jeannie and I owned the company. And, um, and we taught a few more courses, but I was still working full time as an NP. And so this is how my schedule would go. I would work in an NP clinic, seeing patients Monday through Thursday night. On Thursday or Thursday, you know, like late afternoon, I would hit the Lafayette airport on the last flight out and fly to wherever we were gonna teach a review course. I would teach a review course Friday, Saturday, half a day, Sunday, and fly home on Sunday evening. And my week would start all over again. But, you know, as time went on, we grew the number of locations where we taught courses. And we began to have more requests for courses than we could, we could meet. So we decided, and it was only one of me. And so we decided we got to get another way to get this material out. So, so we then began to record it and we would sell recordings of it. And, you know, I don't know how old you are cause I can't see most of your faces, but it was cassette tapes. And so we would duplicate these cassette tapes and we would sell them. And so I mean, one thing just led to another and you know, I find myself 25 years down the road. In fact, I, I, told, um, I told the group that, we, that was on before we, we officially opened this, I think today might be the 24th anniversary of our company. I think so, because it was mid-November. So it, anyway, it's like 24 years right now and 25 books later and, and I don't know, probably a thousand review courses or maybe more, lots and lots of miles, but you know, this is where, this is where I've arrived. And, you know, I, I love being a nurse practitioner. I tell people all the time, it's the most fun you will ever, ever have in nursing. 
because I think it really is. But I love what I do. And mostly I enjoy helping people as I did when I found out I really love being a nurse. I love to help them in a different way. I enjoy teaching and, you know, I, I love to see a smile on a patient's face when something you've done for them has helped them. And it, it really just kind of makes your day and you know what I'm, I'm talking about. The last thing I want to tell you before I take your questions, and I want you to feel free in asking me anything, is this. That's how I started as a nurse practitioner. You could just as easily substitute your own name in my story. You could. If I can do this, anybody can. So I want you to think about that. Think about what you're going to contribute to this profession that is going to become your love and become a part of you. Think about what you're going to do. And I know that it's difficult for you right now. If you're in, in school, you're trying to become an NP or you're in a DNP program, you're overwhelmed with things. But our profession needs whatever you have to give. And if teaching is something that you can contribute, then that's what you need to begin to think about doing. And you have no idea how fulfilling it will be for you 10 years or 20 years or maybe 50 years down the road. You know, I ask people when I teach live courses who the, who the founder of our profession is. And most people can't tell you. But we are one of the few professions where our founder is still alive. It's Dr. Loretta Ford. She is going to celebrate her 100th birthday this year. And so think about what you can contribute because our profession needs you. So I'm going to stop. I welcome your questions. I've never heard a dumb one. So please feel free to ask, ask away. And uh, even if, it is, if it's about preparing for the exam, it can be about whatever, but I'm anxious to talk with you and meet you. Excellent. Uh, so I, I think one that we have a question from Dr. Obliner to get you started off with. Okay. Um, I just want to remind all the students, please add your questions in the chat feature so we can start pulling them. And I'm going to call you on you to ask the question to Dr. Oye. Um, and after Dr. Oberleitner, I might have a follow-up question as well. So Dr. Oberleitner, why don't you ask your question? So Amelie, um, from your, from your beginning, you know, obviously we, um, everyone transitioned to doing things more um, using, you know, computer-based technology, including online learning. And, and with COVID, you know, we all had to make that transition um, to more uh, online platforms. So how have you transitioned um, to digital or online platforms? Well, we, since we have built this company, we've always invested in our infrastructure and I never knew how value it, valuable it was gonna be. The fact that our, our URL is apea.com tells you that we were one of the first people out. So we got a website early on and it, at, at the time it was called a web page because that's all it was, it was, a, it was a page. And it would say, welcome to whatever. You couldn't buy, you couldn't do anything on that. And, uh, and you know, there really wasn't good bandwidth to support things. So, you know, for 25 years, we have been building, building, building infrastructure with online tools to deliver things really around the world. We have customers around the world. So it was not, it was not real difficult. It, it was, but it, it was not as much difficulty as a lot of people had when we moved from doing live on-site review courses to an online environment with live webinars because we had infrastructure built. And so um, even the, the tools and, and things, products and things that we deliver to, to universities and people around the United States and, and Australia, New Zealand, Canada, every military base in the world uses our products. So we've been in, that, in the business of delivering things around the world for a long time. So, um, you know, I don't know, I don't know if that's what you were looking for, but 
it wasn't a, a stretch for us as much as I know it was for a lot of people. Although we wanted to get more things um, up and going. And, you know, 2021, we, we've used, we've taken uh, the opportunity during COVID because I have more time, a little bit more time. We, we've developed, you know, multiple new products that are gonna hit in 2021. So we used the time during COVID to, to move our business forward when things got up and cranking again. So we, we were very aggressive in doing that early on. And I think it's because we were able to easily transition. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I think uh, a couple of the professors have a couple of questions for you. Dr. Lemoyne, I think you have a question. Is that correct? I do. So, so Amelie, you have been doing this so well for so long. What do the participants of your, um, your program, what do they say is the biggest challenge for passing the certification exam? We have a, a lot of our 584 students here as well as 82 and 83 students. And um, it's probably something that they're thinking and maybe just uh, didn't ask yet. Okay, um, I'm, Jennifer, I'm so glad you asked that because you know, one of the things you have to realize is that passing the certification exam is not, not about memorizing an answer to a question. Being able to pass a certification exam is about being able to critically think. And you know, I'll tell you the truth, the first time I heard that term critical thinking was when I was a nursing student at, at UL. And throughout my experiences as a student at UL, it was always about critical thinking and that's what it takes. So, you know, you're gonna be given a set of facts every time you walk into an exam room, the patient will be a little bit different. Their allergies, allergies will be a little bit different. Their medical history will be a little bit different. And you've gotta be able to adjust and pivot and, and critically think is the term that should be used. So you have to be able to critically think, but obviously your ability to critically think is dependent on your having a good foundation of facts. So in your earlier classes, the most important thing to do is learn those facts. And then, you know, as you move into the second set of clinicals, you learn more facts and you begin to manipulate them. And then in the, the third and your last clinical, you learn more facts, but now you should become more comfortable at manipulating them. Like, what do you do if you're treating gout in a patient who's a kidney patient? You know, you can't give them an NSAID if they're, if they have gout and they're on an anticoagulant, you know, if they're, if they have gout and, and you want to give prednisone, you can't because they're a diabetic. It's about being able to do all of that. That's what the successful student on the exam is able to do. And it's all about critically thinking. So um, that's what, you know, that's what students have the most difficulty with because, you know, in lower levels, it's about learning the answer to a question. You know, it's, it's just stocking your brain with facts, but it's not about the facts. You have to practice critically thinking. So that's, uh, that's one of the most important things, Dr. Lemoyne, I, I can tell students. Yeah. All right, excellent. You're getting like all these gems of great advice right now. I'm getting so excited myself, so I'm not gonna lie. Uh, Lisa, I think you got a question too, right, don't you? Yeah, Amelie, so you bring the historical perspective of the nurse practitioner. You started when the role was very new, and now it's much more evolved and much more mature as a role. Just a little perspective on how you've seen the nurse practitioner role really evolve over the years, and where do you see it going from here, especially in, in, under the influence or maybe, maybe possibly with the influence of COVID. So just a little bit about where have we been as nurse practitioners, not we, because I'm not a nurse practitioner, but where nurse practitioners have been and where we're going? Um, I think that's a really good question because, you know, to know where you are, you have to have know, you have to know from where you've come. And if you're in this NP profession that's only been around since the mid 1960s, which might sound old to you, but it's really not when you compare it to any other profession, you have to know where you've come from. And in the state of Louisiana, nurse practitioners were not always able to write a prescription. When I first started as an NP, we had to call in a prescription and it was always under a, a physician's name. And then we had the demonstration project 
which um, you know probably sounds like Greek to anybody, but but I was a part of that, and I, actually I was a state board of nursing's representative on this board with the docs, the the the, the medical board, the nursing board, and the pharmacy board, and I, I represented nurse practitioners, and and that was where they first said, well, why don't we let nurse practitioners physically write a prescription, but only if they're in a rural area. And so every, we could all agree to that. And so the docs agreed to that. And when that went really well, we said, look, we're it's the same functioning individual, whether in, we're in a rural area as opposed to an, an inner city. So, you know, things have really come along a lot for us. Uh, we still work in a, in a state that requires a collaborative practice agreement. But if you're in school right now, you need to prepare for not having that because you know, 23 or 24 states now don't require a collaborative practice agreement for a nurse practitioner to practice. You know, I'm not asking to practice independently. No provider practices independently. Nobody practices in a silo. And if you do, run from whoever that is. Every doc collaborates with other docs, other nurses, other professionals, and you're gonna do the same thing. So I'm a big proponent of, of getting rid of a, a, a mandate to, to have a babysitter for, for lack of another word. And um, so I think you need to be prepared with the skill set that not having a collaborative practice agreement uh, is gonna bring, which means you need to think like a businesswoman or a businessman. You need to, you know, there are a lot, there's a, there's a whole new skill set um, if you choose to open a clinic, um, you know, who will you hire and how will you manage your practice and how much experience do you need to have before you feel comfortable in doing that? So, Dr. Broussard, in, in the 25 years that I've been an NP, you know, things have changed a lot. And in the next 25 years, things are going to change even more. And that's why I'm such a, you know, an advocate for a, a DNP, because for me, you know, I, I told you that I love being a student, but every single thing that I learned in my DNP program, every single thing is something that I turned right around and was able to put into my practice. Even research that you think you'll never use. The biostats, right? A drug rep walks in with a study. I can look at that right away and tell you, oh, look at you, Anna's only 23. I mean, I could... So every single thing that you learn needs to be something that you can turn around and use. And for me, that's what my DNP was. And if you think you're going to practice another 10 years or longer, you absolutely need to consider a DNP. Um, you know, nursing has this thing of about every 10 years, they, they give you a 10 year lead, leeway. But, you know, there was a time when nurse practitioners didn't even have to have a, a BSN. Right. You didn't, you just had a certificate. If you had an RN behind your name, you could be an AD nurse, have an NP certificate and still practice. And then you had to have a BSN and then you had to have a master's. And I, I certainly see things moving in the direction of a DNP. So um, a lot of changes have gone, have, have taken place and plenty more to take place. Thank you, ma'am. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Oye, oh, yeah, I have a question I have to read for you. Uh, unfortunately, the, the, their microphone is not working, so uh, Norma Marie Simpson, hopefully I don't mess this up. Uh, your accomplishments are impressive, to say the least. Did you have much, if any, opposition along the way? If so, how did you handle it? Um, I can tell you that we had a tremendous amount of opposition. My opposition, my best training for my opposition that I would have as a nurse practitioner came in my accelerated option program. There were four students who were gonna get a BSN in a 15 month period. And the people that gave us the most difficulty were the non, were the BSN students who weren't accelerated because they thought we were being given an easy road to get a BSN. And so, you know, I hate to even say this, but, but we would have to go to the library to read certain articles and, and sometimes those articles were hidden from us or they had some things and they didn't share it with us. And, and I grew up with three brothers. 
And so I was used to just having to be scrappy. <laughs> so, you know, that was all very good preparation when I became a nurse practitioner because docs viewed us 25 years ago and in varying parts of that now as competition for them. And, you know, I come from, from nursing with a completely different skill set, a view of the world that docs don't have, that DOs don't have. You know, you come with a, a nursing frame of mind. Uh, it's a different way to help people get better. And, and so uh, there's a lot of opposition and you're going to meet it. But I find that if you present yourself professionally and you always are professionally dressed and professionally spoken and your behavior is professional, that people have a much harder time trying to negate you, including people who have MD behind their names. So you have to be willing to stand up and you have to know your profession. You have to know from where things have, have come in order to be able to know where you are right now and where you're going. And, you know, it's part of that, that mentoring that you should be getting, that you should be getting right now in school and also in your clinicals from whoever's precepting you. And there's mentoring that goes on after you graduate. Um, that's why it's so important to join, you know, your state nurse practitioner organization, your national nurse practitioner organization. It's just important to do that as, as part of that mentoring process. And it, it's ongoing. I mean, I learn something every single day. And, um, you know, you got to do the best you can. And I, and I tell people, you know, that's why they call this the practice of nursing, because you practice every day. You don't get it right every day. And every day you elevate a speech about what an NP can do gets a little more refined and a little bit better and rolls off your tongue with greater ease. And you'll see if you just practice like that, that things are gonna come along for you too. Excellent answer. Uh, we got a couple more questions, I believe. Uh, Dr. Lemoyne, I think I'm gonna let you ask yours real quick. So you can talk about it because I think you're specific to a certain class, correct? So Yeah, so, so Dr. Oyo, we have three DNP students here with us tonight and I'm so glad that they joined us. I I've also would like to recognize Brent Ramsey and thank him for his service on this Veterans Day. Thank you, Brent. Um, but they're taking a nursing leadership class, Nursing 807. My question is, what are the different or similar leadership skills and styles that you had to employ as an NP, as an entrepreneur, and then I know that you are a huge policy advocate for the profession. <laughs> so what are the leadership uh, skills? Because, I, you know, I would imagine that, you know, as, as a nurse practitioner, you have, a, have one set of leadership uh, skills as an entrepreneur, you have to possess a whole different set and probably some of them cross over. And then as an advocate for the NP profession. I guess the, the simplest way to describe being a leader is to be good at what you do and know the direction you're going in. If you work every day to be the best that you can be, at the end of 365 days, you've improved a lot. And at the end of 10 years of doing that, you've improved more than tenfold. So I think that leadership, you know, really means two things, whether you're a leader in whatever it is you do, Dr. Oberleitner is a leader of this organization, of, of the College of Nursing but it's about being good at what you do and knowing where you're going to go. And, and so it, it, I think it just requires, you know, you're, you're learning and inhaling and just getting absorbed in your profession. But the skills, you know, that you need as an entrepreneur, you make different decisions when you're a business owner. You know, I, I tell people all the time that your impression of the world changes a lot when you sign the front of a paycheck instead of the back. You, your view changes a lot. Our revenue model changed a lot with COVID. 
And it's a totally different thing when your name goes on the front as opposed to a back so of a check. So it's a different skill set. It's a different way that you view the world. But regardless of what it is, I think you have to be the best you can. And, and people will see that you're working really hard. And, and if you work hard, you're going to get there. You know, one of the reasons I love Peyton Manning, and, and if, if you've been to Review Course, you know why I, I mentioned Peyton Manning. But Peyton Manning was gifted with talent, but it would have done nothing had he not worked and worked so hard. And so when you, when you put talent with hard work, you're going to get there. And you know, everybody in this webinar was gifted with a high degree of intelligence. You could not be where you are. And if you couple right now what you have with hard work, you're gonna be a leader and you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna be someone that your profession can rely on and someone who is gonna move this profession forward, which is what all of us need to, to be able to do. I started out a while ago and told you, everybody needs to think about what you can contribute to this profession to move it forward. So I don't know if that's what you were looking for, Dr. Lemoyne, but. Thank you so much. And um, awesome. you, you referenced Peyton and I see all the footballs in the background. So <laughs> big, big football fan, I would imagine. I, I am. I'm still glowing from Sunday night. <laughs> Dr. Olia, uh, we got another question. I, I do want to say it's it's been a long time since anyone's told me I had a high degree of intelligence on a webinar, uh, and I appreciate that, but I think that's just by circumstance of me being on here. Uh, so, uh, Roger, <laughs> Roger, I think you are on here. You had a question. Did you jump off already? I, I'm still here. Oh, go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Olia. We've not met yet, but I'm the DMP coordinator uh, at the university, so... It's a pleasure to, to see you, albeit virtually. Hey, um, you, you, as I was uh, hitting send on my chat, you were kind of touching upon the question that I have. Um, <clears throat> but um, as a DMP coordinator, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what you had to say about what you feel as though uh, furthering your education to obtain your DMP adds to both the profession as nurse practitioners, um, but also personally. Uh, what does it add to you uh, in, in, into the profession? Well, I'll, I'll start by, by uh, telling you personally first. The DNP program that I went to uh, was the University of Tennessee. And, you know, I got my DNP in 2007. Okay, that's a long time ago. So there were not a lot of DNP programs around the United States. But I went to, I chose the University of Tennessee because it was one of the seven sisters. Those were the original seven DNP programs in the United States. And I thought that I went to school with, and I know that I went to school with, the 30 smartest nurses in the country. Those are my classmates. I really felt like these people were so smart that we could have solved world hunger, really. What my DNP program did for me, and it was the interaction I had with these 30 brilliant people, was that it gave me a different view of the world. You know, I don't know how big you think your view of the world is, but what doctoral education did for me was give me a much broader view of the world. It helped me look at things from places that I would not have done otherwise. So personally for me, that was huge. For your profession, you know, a lot of professions convey doctorates for only a few more hours than you have in nursing. And so I'm all about being a, a you know, earning a, a doctorate in nursing, a, a DNP specifically, because that clinical piece is so important to nursing. And so I think that um, it isn't just about getting a DNP and giving everybody that degree. But to earn that degree, you've had to do more work, more clinical hours, but not a whole lot compared to most other professions. And so you've done a lot of that work. You need to take advantage of it. And, you know, for your profession, I think overall, it raises the bar. It just raises the bar. Now, I'm, I'm, the, some of the smartest NPs I know do not have a DNP or a doctorate at all. 
but it's about this the the things that your your program I don't know it's it just it just grows you that's what I I you know I can't explain it it the scenario I guess or analogy I would give you was they used to be these dehydrated sponges and when you put them in water they just like did like this and that's what being in a doctoral program did for me it was like the sponge the de dehydrated sponge that you put in water and so I, I loved it. I wouldn't trade it for a second. You know, I wanted to get out. Don't get me wrong, but I loved every minute that I was there. It was just, it was one of my best life experiences. Wow, Dr. Thank you. That, that's awesome. Uh, we're coming to the near the end of our, our talk tonight, but I wanted to ask you if you would to leave any other advice that you haven't discussed already this evening to these students and these professionals um, what would that advice be, whether it be professional or personal, and, and why would that be the last thing you'd want them to know? I guess I want everybody who is a student in here, and you know what, even if you're not a student, Dr. Oberleitner, Dr. Lemoyne, Dr. Broussard, I honestly think that we all need to be more patient with ourselves. I want you to be patient with yourself. Because every day you realize that you're in the practice of nursing and that you don't always get it right. And if you can do better tomorrow than you did today, then it's a win. But in order to be able to do that, you have to accept that what you did today might not have been your best. And so I always encourage students, either that I precept or I, I mentor, whatever I do, is to make sure that you're patient with yourself as you go through your program, as you go through another semester, as you go through a new course, be patient with yourself. Because as long as you know that what you do tomorrow is better than what you did today, it's gonna be a win. And when you can put your head down at night and know that it was a win, you sleep well. And so, I think it starts by being patient with yourself. So those are my, those are my parting words, Tucker. And to all of you on here, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, please enjoy your evening. Go and have a good time. I'm going to ask the professional staff to stay on after this. And uh, if you uh, would like to exit, you may do so again. Thank you, Dr. Oye, a million times over for being with us it this was, evening. It was my pleasure to be with you. And good luck, everybody.